Hey TC3, my name is Chris and here's what's happening in this week's TC3 News. Stay connected to what's happening in the life of the church by following us on social media. Just search TC3 Church on Facebook and Instagram to stay up to date with everything that we have going on. You can also find us on YouTube. Our channel is youtube.com slash TC3 Church. Here you will find all of our services on demand, as well as music videos, children's messages, and youth information. You will also have access to all of our other ministry channels, so make sure that you subscribe today. Oh, and here's a little pro tip. When you see that little bell, make sure you click on that bell and you will be updated when something new is posted and you will never ever miss our new content. Hey TC3, Pastor Carl here. This Sunday, we want to have an opportunity to get to know you a little bit better and invite you to be part of our upcoming life groups. If you could look for me in the lobby around our life group banner, find out more about what we're doing with our life group ministry and how it can affect you and your family. So go to tc3.church slash life groups, find a group that you can connect with and sign up for a life group today. We want to invite you to an experience here at TC3 that we call Rooted. This is a 10 week journey where you can begin to see God in new ways and find yourself in his story. No matter where you stand in your relationship with Jesus, there is always room to move forward. So come and deepen your faith and learn to live out your calling as a radical follower of Jesus Christ. Rooted starts Tuesday, February 9th. So sign up today at TC3 Church slash Rooted. We hope that you will join us and come with an open heart and an open mind and see how God will surprise you. What would happen if the people of God started handling money God's ways? You work too hard to get to the end of your life and have nothing to show for it. This is my family's legacy that I'm talking about here. I've got to have a plan and be focused. That knowledge that you pass down to your kids, that is how you change a family tree. You change your life when you get sick and tired of being sick and tired. And you have that moment where you say, I've had it. I'm not going to live like this anymore. You guys, I can honestly tell you that Financial Peace University is an absolute game changer. My wife and I have personally taken it twice, and if you follow the plan that he lays out, you will live in financial freedom. Classes start February 9th at 6.30, and one of the best things is child care is provided as well. So we will see you on February 9th. Families, we have an amazing Paris night out coming up Friday, February 12th from 5.30 to 8 right here at TC3. It's called our annual Valentine's Olympics. Now, for $8 a kid, we're going to give them dinner, prizes, games, even a Bible lesson about God's great love for His children. The only way to register is go to tc3.church slash kids and look for the Valentine's Olympics near the bottom. So make sure you sign your kids up today. Here at TC3, we're all about connecting people to the life-changing power of Jesus Christ. And we hope that in today's experience, you connect with Jesus in a real way. Well, hey, TC3. We are so excited that you're here with us. Whether you are in-house in our outdoor venue or online, welcome. Would you all stand? We are gonna begin to worship. All right, let's sing this out, come on.
Amen, amen. Isn't God good? Let's continue to worship TC3.
We'll sing it together. The odds stacked against me Surrounded on all sides Oh, I've heard you can part the waters So in your name Come and turn the tide I'm staring at this mountain No chance I'm getting through But I heard they can melt before you So in your name I'm asking him to move now, Come on, in faith Let that break
cross and before It is finished, it is done Yeah, I hurt you till death, it was over So in your name, I claim this fight is won That's right Amen, you guys can be seated Man, would you guys give God praise in this place this morning? Man, we're so thankful that you guys are here. Whether you're here with us in-house, you're watching online, or you're watching outside in the lawn, we're so thankful that you're here. Yeah, guys, we can give a hand clap for that. We're so thankful for what God has done, and we're so excited that people can come to this place and not come inside this place uh, and be comfortable outside where they are. And we get to love on them right here today and so we're thankful that you're here as well if you are new with us if it's your first time with us watching online watching outside we want you to go to a website www.tc3.church slash new this will give you an opportunity to fill out a form really quickly and we just want to know a little bit more about you we want to be able to love on you and pray for you and let you know a little bit about our church family as well now, we're excited because as you walked in, you probably saw some of the scouts that we have serving with us today. And today is Scout Sunday. It's a very special day annually for all scouts. And Scout Sunday, it's just, it's just a chance for scouts to display their duty to God in a very real way. So the Cub Scout Pack 801 has continued to adapt and thrive throughout the challenges of, of this past year and this COVID season. And they have asked us to announce a special thank you to the parents and leaders and the TC3 for making it all possible for their pack to grow. And so if you're a parent or if you're a scout, I'm gonna ask that you stand up really, really quickly. And we just wanna celebrate you guys. We wanna be so thankful for you guys and what you guys are doing. Man, thank you guys so much for, for being here. Just know when you give, you participate in ministering to the future generation through organizations like this Cub Scout Pack that are here today. And we wanna continue to do that. So we're gonna go into a time of, of giving and offering. And if you wanna give today, it's really easy for you. You can text the number 77977 with the words TC3 and whatever amount you feel led to give or or you can give as you exit today. There are giving buckets at the information desk on either side as you exit. Would you pray with me? Jesus, we're so thankful. We're so thankful that we get to be a part of your family. We're so thankful, Jesus, that you've given us opportunities to not just come and, and to worship, but to put your son Jesus on display for the world to see. And so God, I pray that in these moments that we would dive into community, that Jesus, our hearts would be softened, that we would hear your word and that we would respond to it. And Jesus, whatever burden, whatever weight, God, we feel on our lives, Jesus, I pray that in the moments to come that you would lift it and that we would surrender it to you. God, we love you. And we're so thankful for who you are. In Jesus' name, amen. I invite you guys to stand with us. Come on.
Rock'em Sock'em Robots. Who remembers? You knocked my block off. You remember that? Right? And then you would retaliate because they knocked your block off. Because retaliation is a lot easier than reconciliation, isn't it? Well, we're going to, we're going to be doing a series here, and it's called Reconcilable Differences. Uh, as far as it depends on you, as, as the Apostle Paul said, live at peace with everyone he talked about in the book of Romans. And we're going to be diving into some topics that are going to be a little bit challenging for some of us, but healthy for all of us. And the fact is, is that God wants us to be rela- relationally right uh, with him and with each other. And the standard in the scripture calls us to that, but we've all uh, offended other people and we've all been offended. Have you ever been offended by something that someone said to you? Yes, maybe even today, maybe this morning. You may be offended right now. I still hold the offense of the woman who said I dress like a landscaper until, until I was looking at the Easter story with fresh eyes and Mary mistook Jesus for a gardener. So I was like, well, I'm in pretty good company. Right? But all of us have had people say things that have, have uh, hurt us. They, they've, they've struck us deep, and they've impacted us in ways that we could have never imagined, and some of us are still even carrying those hurts with us today, and the Lord would want us to be set free from that, and then all of us, too, have been the offender. We've all said things to people or done things that have been hurtful to other people. I still remember being in the dunk tank when we were trying to raise some money for our kids' department, and there was this kid throwing the ball at the, at the bullseye, and I'm sitting up there, and I looked at him, and I said, hey, if you hit that target, what I'll do is I'll chase down whoever got that, gave you that haircut, and you, you, can, you can have your way with them. And he said, my mom gave me this haircut. And I was like, probably not the best thing to say as an adult to like an eight-year-old kid. But we've all said things and done things that we wish we could, we wish we could take, take those things back. And, and we're trying to figure out how to make those things right. And the fact of the matter is, is where, there is where there's separation, if two parties are willing to surrender to God's way, there can be reconciliation. It, it can happen. The Lord can bring things together that have been divided and separated by the enemy, and he can bring healing where there's been division. And it says in Colossians chapter 3, verse number 13, this is a good one for you to take a picture of or get your U versions out on your uh, phones and follow along with me. In Colossians 3, 13, it says these words, make allowance for each other's faults. Make allowance for each other's faults. Forgive anyone who offends you, hard to do. Remember, though, this is what helps us. Remember the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. God forgave us, so he's called us to be people that are forgiving. And we don't get to see, and especially as we process through this, we don't get to see God restore every single relationship. There are, there are things that have happened, and there's water under the bridge, and there are people that are stuck in, in moments. But what I will say is that God still does restore relationships. He still makes something beautiful out of the ashes of the messes that we make in our life, and he still fixes things that we feel like are impossible to fix. And there are relationships right now in my world that have been incredibly broken to a place where I never thought they would be repaired or restored, but because God is in the middle of it and was in the middle of it, those relationships have actually gotten better and they've thrived and we grew through that division and now our relationship is stronger than ever before. So God can bring healing where there has been division. But what we can do, knowing that the dynamics that are involved in our situation, what we can do is we, com- we can commit to not being the one who stands in the way of reconciliation. We can't force the other person to come into a reconciled state, but we can be the one who decides, hey, I'm not going to be the one who stands in the way of reconciliation. Now, there's a great story that I came across. It's about one of the oldest uh, Christian sites in Ireland. 
And over in Ireland, St. Patrick's Cathedral stands tall in Dublin. And if you go over there, you'll see a beautiful piece of Christian history that has survived hundreds and hundreds of years. And they have an incredible artifact there, and it's called the Door of Reconciliation. And so this has survived from the 1400s. And amazingly enough, they still have it on display today. But if you look at the door, there's a hole that's hacked out in the middle of the door. And the story goes like this. There were two families that began to feud. It was basically a power struggle for control of the nation. It was the Butlers and the Fitzgeralds, and it was in the 1400s. And they were battling for control in power. And first it was just a feud, and that's typically how it works with us. It's just kind of a feud. But then it turned into a fight, and the fight turned bloody. There was bloodshed, warfare, loss on both sides, and there was incredible division. And the butlers were besieged by the Fitzgeralds. And so they sought refuge in St. Patrick's Cathedral. Their friends, their followers, and their family members, they ran to the cathedral and they locked themselves in. And this really puts on display that we tend to like retaliation more than reconciliation because this feud had become this fight. And the truth of the matter is, and the Scripture says this very clearly throughout, it's the principle that we can't be on good terms with God when we're on bad terms with people. It's the proverbial pebble in, in the shoe, and I've had times in my life where God has brought it to my realization that my relationship with God was suffering because my relationship with some people is suffering. And so this is where this place landed, and it brought them to this place. There's a passage of Scripture in 1 John chapter 4, verse number 20, that says this, if anyone says, I love God, yet hates his brother, he's a liar. He's a liar. If anyone who does not love his brother, whom he can see, cannot love God, whom he has not seen. So God brings this down to pretty simple terms, like we have to love each other if we've embraced the love of Christ. And we can't make everyone be reconciled with us, but we can make it easy for people to be reconciled with us. Now, get that principle down. There are ways that we can make it easy for people to come back into relationship with us, even though even though they have severed the relationship. We can make it easy. So the story of the Fitzgeralds and the Butlers continues, and so the Fitzgeralds had besieged the Butlers' residence. The, resident, the, the Butlers had taken refuge in St. Patrick's Cathedral, and, and the head of the Fitzgerald clan, the head of the family, he started to realize that this feud was absolutely ridiculous. Here were two families that loved their family members, that loved their country greatly, and that went to the same church, like believed in the same God. So when you think about that, there's a lot of par parallels from the 1400s to today. But yet, these two families are in this bitter, bitter feud, fighting terribly. So Mr. Fitzgerald, he wants to solve the problem and so he calls out to Mr. Butler, and he says, listen, come out of the cathedral. There won't be any retaliation. Let's fix this feud and this fight, and let's stop the bloodshed, and let's decide to not seek revenge on each other. And he wanted Mr. Butler to come out of the cathedral. But Mr. Butler, like some people, right, he decides that he will not come out of the, theater, the cathedral because he doesn't trust Mr. Fitzgerald. Isn't that the process in reconciliation? It's like you want to be reconciled, but they don't want to be reconciled, so you have this problem. He was convinced that it was a trap, and so he wanted to stay behind the protection of the door. So here's what Mr. Fitzgerald does. He grabs an ax, and he chops a hole in the door. He chops a hole in the door, and if you're on the inside of the door, it doesn't seem or sound like reconciliation is coming your way. And in a very bold moment, he sticks his hand, Mr. Fitzgerald sticks his hand through the door, and there would be seconds that would pass that would seem like an eternity because he knew that his hand could literally get cut off by who had been his enemy. 
And when he stuck his hand through the door, it was grasped by another hand in the church. And the door was open, and two men embraced, and the feud was over. And the phrase, chancing one's arm, came from that particular story. Because Mr. Fitzgerald chanced his arm, reaching out for reconciliation. And when you get into the text of Scripture, the meat of the Scripture, God continually calls us to chance our arm in efforts of reconciliation, reaching out to someone else. And the truth is, is that we need to just get tired of division, of separation, of one being here and one being over there, and somebody has to move, and somebody has to stick out their hands. Somebody has to take a risk for reconciliation to take place. We need to get tired, tired enough to grab our ax and take some action and extend our hand. And we say, Gordon, hey, we have <laughs> irreconcilable differences. They're irreconcilable. We all know what that term is. It's the inability to, to agree on most things, and especially on important things. The inability to agree on most things, and especially on the important things. Another term for it is irretrievable breakdown. It's when two issues or two parties cannot resolve an issue, or the issue will not be resolved. And usually it comes about because there's some type of character flaw or failure, some type of personal conflict or strong belief. We think about this term, and we know the term to be very familiar because all of us have maybe come to this point of irreconcilable differences, and we've conceded that the relationship could never be mended, fixed, or healed, and so we took steps. It's a term that's often tied to marriage, and this series really isn't going to be strictly about marriage. It's going to be about relationships, because whether you're married or not, there's probably somebody in your life that you feel like there is an irreconcilable difference that you have with that person, but yet you love that person, and you really do want that person to do well, and you want the relationship to be better. I think the text of Scripture calls us to that aim pretty clearly, but irreconcilable differences come about because of disagreements over finances or debt management. It comes about because there's been some type of disregard or disrespect in the relationship or somebody was taken for granted for way too long and there was something that caused the two people to grow apart or there was a lack of appreciation or a loss of trust maybe or a lack of priority in the relationship maybe work life balance was out of order or there's a there's a lack of intimacy that created irreconcilable differences or there's a communication issue and it created irreconcilable differences personality conflicts and then there's personal demons that come into play that create irreconcilable differences and there's also family issues that come into play as well Irreconcilable differences are relational walls and wedges that get driven in and they cause and create division. And so, as we think about irreconcilable differences and the people maybe that we have wrestled with relationally and where we're struggling relationally, let's ask some questions. Have I caused or created any <laughs> relational uh, division? Have I caused or created any unhealthy relational division? If the bigger question on that might be, am I doing it right now? If that's the case, then God has called us to make that right. And then the next question is, do I have any unresolved relational regret? Is there anything in our life or our mind or our heart right now that, that causes us regret because we think about a certain relationship and... and we just, it just feels off. It feels like it's, it's unsettled. And it feels like there are things that we wish maybe would have gotten said that haven't been said. Or is there any unresolved regret in any of our relation, relationships? And some of us, we answered yes to both of those questions. Some of us answered yes to one of them. But 
but yet we feel like we're strangely stuck in a moment of time because we feel like there might be, there's just nothing that we can do or say that's going to change the situation. We want it better, but it's still a wrestling match for us. Here's what I'm going to ask us to do. I'm going to ask us to transport that issue into God's hands, to transport it intentionally into God's hands and specifically begin to pray about it verbally for the next you know, month or so. Just put it on your prayer radar, radar for a month or so. And the simple prayer, I'm only going to really call you to do two things today. One is this prayer, this prayer that, that says these words, help me overcome my unbelief. Help me overcome my unbelief. And when you're praying that prayer, think about that relational gap or issue that's in your world. Lord, help me overcome my unbelief. And that prayer really comes from a statement that a, that a father made. Because a father had a son that was wrestling with some demons of his own. And nobody could seem to help his son. And he came in contact with Jesus. And Jesus was somebody who was working out miracles. He's doing the impossible. And when he came to Jesus, he said, if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. So there is this dad who's wrestled. His son is hurting himself. His son has driven a wedge between the family and community. And, and he doesn't know what he can do to help this kid. And he's tried everything. And for many of us, we feel that way when it comes to this relational issue that the Holy Spirit has on our heart and our mind right now. And he said, if you can do anything to help us. And then Jesus responds back, if you can, if you can. And then Jesus goes on and he said, listen, everything is possible for one who believes. Everything is possible for one who believes. And then the father exclaimed, which is the prayer that I'm asking all of us to pray in regards to our relational issues is, I do believe, because we do believe that God can do anything and can mend anything. So here's the, here's the father, I do believe, but help me overcome my unbelief. So this week... This month, if we'll lift up that specific prayer about that specific situation that the Holy Spirit has on our heart and our mind right now, I believe we're going to gain ground in the spiritual world. And I believe the Holy Spirit will then give us action steps to take and timing and words and wisdom, and it'll help us get unstuck. I really believe that. So I'm asking all of us to commit to that prayer of, Lord, help my unbelief. And then I'm asking us to take a personal vow. And the personal vow is this. I'll assume res relational responsibility and I won't let myself off the hook. It's easy for us to let the other person go to the corner and for us to go to our corner. But what if we decided that we were going to take relational responsibility and not let ourselves off the hook? Not be okay with the, the relationship just not being hostile. What if we decided that God had a better plan for that and he wanted that relationship to be mended and he wanted people on earth to be able to look at that relationship and understand the brokenness that was there and see a work of God take place in that relationship and it could stand as a testimony of what only God can do. So I'm asking us to not let ourselves off the hook when it comes to our relational issues and I'm asking us to pray a simple prayer that says, Lord, help us with our unbelief. Romans 12 says it very clearly. It says, listen, don't repay evil uh, for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. And then there is this attorney's phrase in the passage of Scripture, if it is possible. And again, many of us are going, Gordon, this is impossible. We all have impossible situations because we're not just dealing with ourselves, we're dealing with the other party as well. But the book of Romans tells us these words, if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. And I think living at peace with everyone doesn't always mean they live over here and you live over here. It means that you wish the best for them and hope the best for them, and you actually still love them. And they, in turn, wish the best for you, hope the best for you, and still love you. And again, we push back and go, well, Gordon, that ain't never going to happen. Jesus said, 
All things are possible. All things are possible. If you believe, we say, I do believe, but help my unbelief. Reconciliation, it's never been easy. I think about the early church and what they went through. And if you go into the book of Acts, especially chapter 7, there is the first martyr's death, Stephen. Stephen is stoned to death because he's a follower of Christ and he's preaching the message of reconciliation to people who are far from God. And they take him and they basically throw him in a hole and they throw rocks at him until he's dead. It's a horrible, horrible way to die. And it says in the text of Scripture while he's dying, in Acts chapter 8, verse number 1, Saul, who would later become Paul, approved of their killing him. So there is Paul approving the death of Stephen, who was an innocent. Stephen's last words, this tells you how incredible of a man of God he was. His last words were these, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. That's how awesome Stephen was. And Saul is approving of his death. And it says in Acts 1 that on that day, persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem. Everyone was scattered. Godly men buried Stephen, and they mourned deeply for him. And Saul began to destroy the church. On that day, Saul began to destroy the church. If you were living in that time period, if Stephen was a family member or someone that went to church with you, that you loved, someone that maybe stood on the stage and spoke every once in a while, and he just seemed to have a a passion for God and a love for people and pure heart, and Saul approved of his death, and Saul maybe even took part in seeing that Stephen was put to death, how would you feel about about Saul? The early church was mourning greatly because Stephen was put to death. And there was Saul. He began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he drug off both men and women and put them in prison. And Saul is approving of this. He probably had a part, like I said, in Stephen's death, and he's ruining lives of really, really good people trying to do really, really good things. That's what Saul was doing. He had no mercy He was brutal on people that were good and that were kind, and he was feared by the early church, and he was probably even hated by some. Nobody in the early church had any love for Saul, probably at all. But yet Jesus meets Saul on the road to Damascus, knocks him off his horse, and all of a sudden begins this incredible conversion process in his life. And then in Damascus, there's a disciple named Ananias, And Ananias has this vision that he's given by the Lord. So imagine if you're Ananias and you get this vision from the Lord. And the Lord tells him, listen, I want you to go to this house on Straight Street. And when you go to the house on Straight Street, you're going to find a guy there named Saul. And when you hear those words, Saul, you're like, I'd be happy to go. Let me find my club and my knife. Because Saul had done a lot of damage and it was personal. And it was real. He said, I want you to go to the the house on Straight Street. And there's a man there, and he's had a vision that a man named Ananias was going to come and place his hands on him and restore his sight. Ananias responds as you and I would respond. He doesn't want to be a minister of reconciliation, so he makes excuses. He said, I've heard reports about this guy, Lord, in case you're uninformed. I've heard reports about this guy and all the harm he has done, and now he's come here to harm us as well, to arrest really good people who call on your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, go, this man is my chosen instrument. Then Ananias, it says, went, and he entered in the house, and he placed his hands on Saul, and he said, Brother Saul what it would have taken for Ananias to call Saul a brother at that moment is beyond human ability. And where God calls us as believers when it comes to reconciliation is beyond human ability. We say we can't, 
but the Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness to do and be who he's called us to be. And that, those words, Brother Saul, would never leave Saul's vernacular because when he related his testimony, he remembered that he was called Brother Saul in that moment because he knew he was being invited into the fellowship of the church knowing what he had done. And he says, the Lord has sent me, and immediately something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he could see again. And really, the point that is being made in this text of Scripture is that Christians don't run from reconciliation, they initiate it. We initiate reconciliation. As far as it depends on you, as far as it depends on me, let's live at peace with everyone. We don't wait for the first party to make the first move. Isn't that what we do? As soon as they, wow, the apology's got to be better than that, you know. When they move, I move. But listen, Jesus places a really high value on relational health. It's an incredibly high value that he places on it. If you go into Matthew chapter 5, this is, this is the, basically the Sermon on the Mount, and it's tied in there. He said, if you're offering your gift at the altar, you're bringing your sacrifice to the, to the temple in Jerusalem, there's a big long line. You're waiting to get in. If you bring your, te- your, your gift to the altar, and there you remember, my brother or my sister, they have something against me. Like you're standing in line, you've got your sacrifice, the line is long, it's been hard to get there, but you remember your brother or sister has something against you. This is how important Jesus says it is. He says, leave your gift. First go and be reconciled, and then come. Jesus says our spiritual health is tied to our relational health. First go, and then come to the temple. We don't wait for the other party to make the first move. It's not reconciliation instead of worship. We don't go, hey, well, I'm not going to come to church until this situation gets fixed. It's not that. It's not reconciliation instead of worship. It's reconciliation in order to worship. In order to worship. And then he said, settle matters quickly with your adversary who is taking you to court. In other words, he's saying, listen, let's not, let's not have matters settled out there. Let's settle matters Do it while you're still together. Your adversary may hand you over to the judge. And so he's saying, listen, let's rush to make things right because delays can be dangerous. Just as in the story that I talked about the two feuding families in the very beginning, what if they sat at a table? What if they made things right there? They would have foregone a lot of bloodshed. So we rush to make things right because delays can be dangerous. And so then we push back again about taking personal, personal responsibility. Is the statement, I can't be reconciled, or is the statement, I won't be reconciled? I can't be, or I won't be. Because the text of the Scripture says this, make allowances for each other's faults. Forgive everyone who offends you. Remember the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive other people. So this week, let's commit to the prayer of, Lord, help me overcome my unbelief when it comes to the seemingly irreconcilable differences in our life. Let's keep that personal vow that says, I'll assume relational responsibility, not let ourselves off the hook. I I would love it if everybody was around for this entire series and we wouldn't let ourselves off the hook. And let's seek reconciliation over retaliation. Many of us are trying to make people pay The Bible is very clear. Vengeance belongs to the Lord, and when you get to that place where you let it be in the Lord's hand, there's freedom that comes in your life and a strange peace that comes with it. We can't be on good terms with God when we're on bad terms with his kids. We're called to initiate reconciliation. We don't wait for it. So let's do whatever it takes. Let's get our ax, okay, use it appropriately, and break down whatever walls between us and them and be willing to extend our hand. Father, I pray for those that are in the house, out on the lawn and watching online that, that have faces in their minds right now where there are relationships that are broken and there are, there's pain associated with it and there's turmoil and anxiety and frustration that comes would you would you be the god that helps heal 
things that are broken? Would you help our unbelief when it comes to resolve in those specific areas? And would you help us to not let ourselves off the hook and to be who you've called us to be in these situations, no matter how the other person responds? Father, I thank you that when you call us to do things that seem to be impossible for us to do, the Holy Spirit equips us. And when we are weak, God, you are strong. So may the Holy Spirit speak to us. May, it cal- may he calm us. And may he direct us and lead us into all truth about whatever situation is being brought to our heart and our mind right now. Father, I thank you that you are a forgiving God who forgave us and continues to forgive us and love us in spite of what we have done and what we continue to do. May we, dear Lord, follow the example that you have set for us. And may may there be reconciliation in our life with you first and then with others. In your name we pray and receive. Amen.
Amen. Amen. So glad that you guys came. Hey, listen, if you need prayer, there are going to be people available underneath the screens. Take advantage of that. We'd love to pray with you. We say it each week and we mean it. Mission Field begins as soon as you guys hit those doors. God bless. We'll see you next week. <laughs>